to the Other Goddess podcast with spiritual detective Dr. Joanna Kuyava and its motto, if you want to be spiritual, ask difficult questions. In this podcast, we discuss the archetypes of the Other Goddess, new forms of consciousness they inspire, as well as the interconnection between sexuality and spirituality. You can join the conversation by signing to the Other Goddess podcast, my YouTube channel, Dr. Joanna Kuyava, or even better through my book, the Other Goddess, Mary Magdalene and the Goddesses of Errors and Secret Knowledge, published by Sacred Stories. Today, we have a fascinating conversation with Miguel Conner, the host of the Eon Byte Gnostic Radio, author of many books, but especially the Voices of Gnosticism and most recently 10 Snackable Meditations. Hi, Miguel. How are you? I'm doing good. Thanks for having me on. Wonderful. So I just want to say that um, I first got to know you through your book, The Voices of Gnosticism, and I recommend it very highly for everybody because it gives you a fantastic overview of every possible Gnostic movement through the, inter I think there are tr uh, transcripts of the interviews from your show, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. when I started to be interested in Gnosticism, this was like the ideal book, you know, so I have all legitimate sources, you know, very ap approachable, you know, and through uh, uh, basically the major scholars in the field, but in a very approachable way. So that, that was a wonderful book and I know that you have a sequel to this book as well, right? The Other Voices of Gnosticism, also a fantastic book. So uh, for me, Miguel is this example of uh, uh, Gnostic sage <laughs> and, uh, and complete Gnostic aficionado and complete well of knowledge on Gnosticism because I know that scholars from experience, that scholars usually like to go to their own little tunnel and you know, all they know is you know, the beginning, the middle and possibly the end of a tunnel. But it is very rare to meet someone who knows pretty much everything on the topic because he is not limited by, you know, strange rules of academia and so on. So although academia can be sometimes supportive of our research, in many ways it is very limiting. So it's wonderful to have you, Miguel. Well, thank you. Thank you. I certainly appreciate what scholars do, but yeah, I think... Uh... Uh, history is one thing, but how a religion impacts us is always our culture, our art, and yes. the ancients, I'm sure, were no different. They had their own pop culture, their own uh, culture, their own psycho psychology, consciousness, to see it. So seeing it in a more holistic way always helps. And again, how it impacts us today, what's the stream and where things might be going. So it's nice to contribute in that way. But yeah, I, I appreciate all these scholars who put a countless amount of hours in the field to bring insights that help those of us who are not just learning, but want to experience something mystical or greater from these groups or try to understand our culture around us and how it's been influenced. Yes, and quite recently I just posted something innocent, I thought, on Facebook and I got the feedback immediately, we live in Gnostic times, Joanna, that's why, so <laughs> obviously, you know, it is somehow relevant. But first, um, I would like to ask you, you know, how actually you encounter the path of Gnosticism, if there is such thing, because it's such a broad group, the Gnostics, but how, how, how did you... What happened there, you know? How actually you started to think about Gnostics? Because usually people come to spirituality in the West, you know, through yoga, or they got interested in Buddhism, or they went to India, you know what I mean? And it's not such a common thing, you know, to, to be interested in Gnosticism and take it up in such a serious uh, way that you did. Yeah, I can't say there was a... Uh road to Damascus uh, experience <laughs> or under a Bodhi tree. You might say it was a slow burn, like all of us. So we're, uh, you're looking for the big questions in life. Why am I here? What happens after we die? The nature of evil, all that other good stuff. And Gnosticism, I was always, I've always been very ecumen ecumenical. I love all religions almost equally. I don't think there's one that's less or more deficient than the other. They're all just part of... Uh, the same search for what is human and what is reality. But Gnosticism started answering those questions more and more. But if you want to say when it became, when it like, as they say, got under my skin or was injected in my blood, 
I'd probably say reading Philip K. Diggs' Vallis, because this was an individual who not only had studied Gnosticism, but he was able to translate it in a modern way through science fiction and philosophical speculative fiction. And he really opened my eyes because I realized, yes, this is the world we live. This is the warning of the Gnostics. And again, he was able to translate it in a way that made complete sense to me. And even then, I remember reading Vallis and, you know, you're getting interested in Gnosticism and you're like, oh, cool, Mary Magdalene, Sophia, they have a divine feminine. But in Dick's uh, Vallis, Sophia does make an appearance as the savior figure. But it's a very, uh, you might say, sad ending, let's put it this way. The good guys do not win in Philip K. Dick's cosmology or in his mythology, because Vallis is also his great speculation on the cosmos and what will, what will happen. So that, was, that I remember annoying the shit out of me. But of course, instead of just rejecting it, I said, well, why, why? And of course, you start studying and you realize... Yes, yeah, Sophia is in the Old Testament, but she's uh, in a cloud. She's abandoned. She's the Shekinah is crying for her people. The Book of Enoch says men rejected uh, wisdom, and she's now in a cloud. And you realize, well, he's not wrong. The goddess is there, but unfortunately, we have marginalized uh, her, and, and now it's a matter: are we going to welcome her back or no? I would say I don't know. I don't know yet. Yes, we will have to look into this. So this was actually through the work of fiction. So could you introduce him to, to our listeners? Because he, he, not everybody needs to know him right away. Well, he is the prophet of our times. I think <laughs> if you look at uh, Philip K. Dick's predictions on how the world would be today, from social media to big tech giants to how we interact, how you and I are interacting right now. You can read his works and it's it's all there it's it's eerie and of course dick is famous for being the mind behind uh, cultural impactful movies like uh, blade runner minority report uh, total recall um, the adjustment bureau uh, and uh, the tv the very popular tv series uh, the man in the high castle so your viewers or listeners will know that he is very uh, socially relevant and what he did is uh, made a huge uh, impact on our world and your your listeners will realize yeah a lot of what he predicted from the man in the high castle to blade runner seems to be at least on a thematic level have come true today and something to do also with the development of artificial intelligence and so on, right? Exactly. As being the crazy gods that actually create a life that we cannot understand. We understand very little about our own lives. And here we are creating, and we are at the moment creating another form of life. Do you think that uh, he was a mostly visionary or was it coming from... Uh, some spiritual experience. I know that I read something that he was getting some download, you know, in conspiracy theories, they say there's this black knight orbiting a, a the earth and so on. And there's this AI thing that was downloading, you know, something to his brain. So do you have an opinion about that? Well, he's, he had several mystical uh, experiences. Uh, he had a very, I uh, guess, sordid and disturbed life for various reasons. Mm -hmm. But he had some gain, some experiences that changed his life. He really, uh, again, Vallis, uh, he saw as a sort of benign satellite or AI or spiritual being. He's, he never really says what it is mm -hmm. that's trying to wake us up from this uh, hologram or simulation that we live in. And his most famous vision was when he, uh, uh, well, it's a long story, but uh, he suddenly saw that we did live in a hologram and we still were living in the th second century. And he was the Apostle Thomas and this secret group of uh, Christians called the Gnostics were trying to fight uh, the empire, the Roman Empire that had created this hologram with the help of what he called, uh, well, he called him the Demiurge, but he called him other names like uh, a dangerous magician and all that. Mm. And uh, time had really stood still and we were all trapped in this uh, terrible simulation trying to escape and uh, return to the stars. We were all basically aliens. And he had visions like that. And some again, some of his prophecies came true. He was able to 
uh, the, again, this being Valis that would send you pink beams, that was his version of downloads, mm -hmm. uh, warned him to his son being very sick. And all of a sudden he knew his son was sick and he grabbed his son with his, and said, told his wife, Tessa Dick, we're going to the hospital. And, oh my God, the doctor found out he had a hernia that was about to explode and he saved wow. his son's life. So he had predictions or he had or things like he would write a novel and then suddenly it would happen in real life. And it could be something mundane, like meeting a guy at a gas station who said certain words to him. And these were verified by other people. So he was uh, definitely a madman and a mystic, which is what I think any modern Gnostic should be. And also, I mean, I think every mystic has to be a little bit of a madman or a madwoman. I mean, because you go completely against the, the main narrative of uh, what society is telling you is right or wrong, right? What is true yeah. or not true. So in What did uh, Stefan Heller say? What's the difference between a mystic and a madman? Uh, a, mad, uh, a mystic knows to keep his mouth shut. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, yeah, it is, it is, yeah, that's true, that's true, that's a very good definition. But let's go back to the origins of Gnosticism, because there is some debate there, and I remember when I started to be interested in it, and now I know it's wrong, because I was completely uh, relying on uh, Elaine Pagels, was that she said that Gnostics are basically a, a, a branch of Christianity. But recent scholarship says that they are much older than that, perhaps uh, have to do <coughs> with the uh, hermeneutic the traditions of Egypt. And uh, what is your opinion about that? I would agree. I mean, it's kind of a, a straw man of how old they are. Mm -hmm. We do know, I mean, we can safely say, especially when you read uh, newer scholarship like April DeConnick or uh, Dylan Burns, that they were the carriers or the descendants of the ancient Egyptian mysteries. I mean, that's right there. If you look at the rituals, their language, all that, they were taking this ancient, these psychopomps, or I'm sorry, these hierophants, or Egyptian priests were handing this down as, as the Egyptian mysteries were dying during the, during the late antiquity and the rise of the, the Roman Empire. Uh, they, these Gnostics came from them, either as the Christian Gnostics or as the hermetics and uh, i think that's that's a pretty sound uh idea also and i don't even know if this is just as radical but then you have the ideas of james mcgrath uh he's also a scholar he says when you look at the language of mendians and other gnostics they have the same words and names for angels and gods that you only find in um in uh, pre-exilic hebrew so he thinks that not only were they taking the Egyptian mysteries, but it's possible that they were the carriers of the ancient shamanistic Hebrew dispensation with Ashira and the spirits and all that. And these kind of went underground and then came up because, again, the idea of uh, Sophia or Barbalo being an extension of Ashira or not is pretty obvious. And again, these scholars have seen that they have uh, that, yeah, they have the words there, the, the terminology, the gods. Uh, so that's, that's a pretty, again, that's also another possibility of, or another stream of how the Gnostics might have happened. Mm, even linguistic similarities. But I'll ask yeah, you well, well, Let me say one more thing. Yeah, and that's what uh, this Dr. Justin Sledge was telling me. By the time of Jesus or before the time of Jesus, Hebrew and Aramaic or Hebrew was dead. Mm. And you look at somebody like Philo of Alexandria. Mm. Philo of Alexandria does not speak a lick of Hebrew or Aramaic. He's mm. just coined Greek. Yes. When you look at the Sethians, they are using very ingenious Aramaic and Hebrew puns that very few people might have even known. So again, that's another hint that they really were carrying this very ancient Hebrew uh, mystical dispensation with them. So it's interesting. They were very embedded in what Judaism was, but as scholars also have agreed, they were probably disenfranchised Jews. They had had it with the temple, the, the corrupt second temple culture, had it with the Roman empire. They just had it and they decided we're going underground. Uh, and we're just going to take this information and ended up in G Egypt. 
So just for our listeners, the sapiens were just one of the many Gnostic groups, because sometimes people think that Gnostics are just some coherent group, but it was far from it. So the sapiens were just one of the groups. So I would like to ask you a question that I ask also to Tobias Churton. And uh, do you think that these traditions actually come from Egypt? And you, so you sort of answered, and perhaps from early Judaism, or whether they came from the East, like uh, from India via Persia and so on, because this is also a scholarly discussion about that. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's almost obviously Gnosticism and Buddhism are sister religions. Mm -hmm. Now, whether is this is the human consciousness where, you know, as uh, Yuan Culiano said, we our minds work in zeros and ones. One idea is going to be the solar male organized this is civilization the other one's going to be the anarchist holistic embedded in nature and this is always going to happen i mean buddhism like gnosticism was a reform movement it was critical it was anarchist it was about the interior world of every human being instead of this so whether there's a connection i don't know but uh with when you look at zoroastrianism by default in those times as much as other religions want to deny it everybody was influenced by Zoroaster. I mean, he was the, uh, I don't know, Elvis Presley. I think of a great musician. People mm -hmm. can deny you're not influenced by them. It's like, well, I'm not influenced by Aristotle. Everybody's influenced by Aristotle because of logic and all this. So Zoroaster was huge and he, he influenced the Jews in Babylon. He, in, he influenced Egypt. He influenced the, I mean, or the later, uh, yeah, the, definitely the Babylonians. He was like, his work on dualism and powers and light and darkness was a huge influence. So obviously it would have influenced the Gnostics too. I mean, although obviously Plotinus says they are too dependent on the Orient. They're too dependent on Zoroaster. But uh, yeah. again, he, he had, the, the Gnostics definitely loved his ideas of light and darkness and good and evil and all this other stuff. That's very interesting, thank you, because actually Tobias Charton also thought that, you know, it's coming from there, that it came via Persia from India and, you know, and from the, what we call the Far East. I prefer the idea that our human consciousness evolves naturally this way, you know, that we, we are seeking these answers, but of course there are trade routes and so on, so it is quite possible that it just, the idea is moved, but I think our internal life is taking us there as well. Yeah. So and it's hard because we don't know, we really don't know when Zoroaster was born, some say oh. 300, 600, some have him, you know, 2000 BC. So it's kind of hard. But like you said, the human mind is always going to have the Gnostic minded, the mystically minded, just as you're going to have the, those who want a, you know, a structured religion. And that's the play within all of our minds. And that's the play within humanity. Yeah. So it's like a play of consciousness in a way, you know, between the, uh, as you say, something more holistic and anarchic and, and something looking for organization and numbers. And again, we, we, we live this reality even now. Yeah. Because it is a short podcast, uh, Miguel, I would really like you to go into the Gnostic goddesses, such as, I don't know, maybe Noria, you know, Barbello, Sophia. We discussed Sophia in your uh, past podcast, but you know, she's so big in Gnosticism as well. So uh, pick one and just go with it. And then we move on to Mary Magdalene with the rest of the time. Pick one for, um, uh, for God, it's hard because, uh, well, it's hard because when you realize they're all the, they're all the facet of the same goddess mm -hmm. appearing or manifesting in different ways on earth mm -hmm. and in their stories and in their myths. It's, you know, it's that dream quality. I'm sure you see that in Hinduism too. You're, you, you know, that's, that you know a lot more about that than I do. So it's almost hard to say where Barbello starts and Sophia ends or where Mary Magdalene starts and Sophia ends. And, uh, and of course, as I said, it's obvious that these are taken from ancient times from uh, uh, Asherah and, and of course her shadow side or her other side, a knot. I think that's something that gets, uh, that modern new ages have dropped the ball because we think the goddess is oh love and lie love it's like no bullshit just like the male goddess yeah. there's a good aspect and there's a bad aspect. you can live with it or don't live with it there's for a shira the nurturing there's a not the destructive raping 
uh, shadow side. Even people always think of Aphrodite. They forget, you know, Aphrodite kind of, she had her shadow side. She was really the goddess of war. Athena, Athena was wisdom, but she could be as cruel as any being in this universe. So you have, obviously you have the Gnosticism, you have uh, Sophia, but the Gnostics talked about Akamoth or the wisdom of death, or they would say Sophia is uh, the mother of the angels, the angels being the archons, or they would say she's the queen of Hades. So yeah. they saw that shadow side and they were again taking from this primordial goddess that had slowly been marginalized and censored by the cult of Yahweh, the cult of Marduk, and all that and i use the the work you've done and you've mentioned her in uh, past po uh, podcasts is fascinating because you've talked about nimna who yeah. was i think enki's uh other other uh you know better self or concert <laughs> yeah. and this this power is there about these two helper gods because in the what uh, most people overlook in the myth of prometheus prometheus is a great gnostic tale where Prometheus wants to help humanity. Zeus wants to create these slaves. He makes Prometheus create them and Prometheus feels bad. And he says, I'm gonna steal fire from the gods. But they forget that who helps Prometheus get into Olympus? It's Athena. So you have how Enki and Nimna help humans against the other Anunnaki. Yeah. You have that playing off in uh, Athena and Prometheus and in Gnosticism, you have it too, because in their myths, in the garden is the Yaldabaoth, the, the demented creator god, the son of Sophia. She, he can't get Adam to get up and Sophia has to breathe or trick him to breathe his essence to bring him. So that's right there. You've got Sophia playing Athena and you've got Yaldabaoth playing uh, Prometheus or Ink. Obviously details are changed and this one's only the demiurge is the bad guy. But you have this play of male and female helping humanity against a huge order of creation and these two, these gods, whether it's Sophia or Prometheus or uh, Anemna, they're all these trickster archetypes that yeah. go against the flow of the divine that bring change and transition and ultimately bring humanity to be its best or worst side. So, so I hope I didn't go on a tangent here, sorry. <laughs> No, that's was very that's that inspired fascinating. To go okay. You know, we can plan these things, but the best interviews are completely spontaneous. But just, you know, for the sake of our listeners, can you bring up some similarities between Sophia and Mary Magdalene? Yeah, I mean, uh, obviously both. Um, ha when you look at the divine plan as above, so below, mm -hmm. uh, the Gnostics would certainly agree and well, they're not alone. All the mystics would agree too that uh, you've got the logos. That's the male principle of reason, sustenance, uh, uh, you know, uh, the idea of being logical or seeing things as they are. And then you've got the principle of wisdom, the, the, the divine one, more holistic, more nurturing, more encompassing to an extent. Like, yeah, yeah. I mean, well, they both both it's better alone it's not good but both together are good for the mind of god not to be crazy and for humanity to come and this manifests in many tales whether it's isis or osiris and uh, so many others so in the gnostic and you could even say the christian one that's where Ma mary magdalene represents uh the the wisdom and jesus represents the logos and just like in us also you've got uh, Simon Magus and Helen of Troy or Helen of, Ty of, of Tyre also appears in a parallel myth. And so you have this, this, uh, this tale of these two principles that have been separated and are trying to find each other to restore the world. Obviously, Christianity marginalized Mary Magdalene, but to the Gnostic, she was an important uh, bringer of wisdom. She was a Gnostic revealer. She was a hierophant, just like Ellen was. And mm -hmm. these beings were obviously, the Gnostics would consider the manifestations of Sophia on earth, just like other beings were the manifestation of the Logos on earth. So right that, and yeah, when you read the stories of them looking for each other and trying to find each other, <clears throat> interacting in a play of words, you do get that Sophia Logos, uh, that Sophia Logos vibe for sure. Mm -hmm. And very briefly, could you tell us something about Simon the Magician and Helen? Because they are really like the parallel couple you said to Mary Magdalene and, and, and Yeshua or Jesus or Christ consciousness. Yeah. 
Yeah. As I say, um, Jesus and Mary Magdalene are like the Beatles. Simon and Ellen are like the Rolling Stones. Because <laughs> in their that. group, it was kind of like wild sex and drugs and partying. And But Simon Magus, again, according to tradition, uh, John the Baptist was the leader. He was the guy who was, he was bringing that, those ancient Hebrew mysteries, right? Okay. He had handpicked Simon Magus. So, and Simon, and Ellen was part of his, he had 30 disciples and Ellen was a bona fide. She was the only woman, but she was equal to everybody else. But uh, John the Baptist picked Simon and he <clears throat> and Ellen eventually when John was, uh, was killed and some say Jesus also met a bad death. It was Simon and Ellen who would spread these mysteries in a mythological way. Uh, you have uh, this idea that's not that very common in Gnosticism, where you have the first thought of the divine is always female, just like you have Shiva and Prakriti. You've got consciousness and the experience. The experience is a woman because consciousness asks the questions, who am I? What am I about? And it's kind of like he penetrates her and she says, you are this. I will give birth to you are power, you are wisdom, your eternity. In, uh, the, in one of the Gnostic myths, she is the first thought but as she's as creation is happening, these angels, these lower angels or archons, kidnap the first thought and take her down to earth and cast her in a human body named Ellen, and they hide her throughout history. She's Helen of Troy, she's a prostitute in a brothel, she's all these figures yeah. because they want her power because that gives them power. So the primal consciousness, the uh, basically says, well, I, I got to find my first thought or I'm just crazy. And mm -hmm. he, the consciousness manifests as Simon Magus, who is basically the supreme God on earth. And it's his job to find her throughout time. And eventually as Simon Magus, he finds her in a brothel, Ellen. Once they're together, then they're complete, just like when Jesus and Mary Magdalene are complete. And they're able to spread this message across the world to other humans who might be asleep to the truth of this world that has been run by these uh, deficient, deficient, greedy angels. So that's sort of the, the myth right there. But again, their sex were not like the Christians. They were into uh, sex magic, drugs, and all this. They were, they were, they were the Rolling Stones. They were the Rolling Stones, <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> I love this comparison. So now this is a final question for us today. Can you tell us how Gnosticism is uh, relevant for us today? As, as somebody, as I told you, told me we live in Gnostic times, Joanna, so uh, I would like to hear, we would like to hear your take on that. Well, the simple question is something I could go on and on and on about, but f let's look at simulation theory. The Gnostics were the first individuals in the West, uh, East, let's leave East off the table because yeah. there's probably a lot about who said we live in a simulation, we live in a hologram. It's not like the East uh, where it's a nice illusion, but somebody on first uh, on purpose coded this reality and has kept us trapped. Maybe it's us, maybe we forgot, maybe it's some archons, you know, that's depending on the Gnostic sex. Maybe it's a necessary thing, maybe it's benign, maybe it's malevolent, but the Gnostic said these, we live in a hologram. This is not reality, this is not real. We belong outside of this simulation, this video game. They were mocked. I mean, all these religions in the West were like, you narcissist, schizophrenic, crazy Gnostics. Ha, 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 ha. And Western religions did just completely ignore the idea of a simulated theory. I think Descartes talks about, well, what if a demon has created this reality and I must think my way, I think therefore I am. But maybe in fairy lore, you might have this idea of simulated reality in parallel universes. <clears throat> but it was the Gnostics who really championed this. Well, guess what? What simulated theory is now a very logical, mathematical, and scientific reality. You look at Neil Bostrom, you look at uh, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, uh, what did uh, Elon Musk using the science said there's a 1% chance that we do not live in a simulated reality. You know, if somebody could have created a simulated reality, they already would have done it and they were already placed us in it. Just like the idea, if, if time travel is possible, somebody's already doing. So if yeah. simulation 
theory is re is possible, then we're already in a simulated reality or part of us is. So that's just one uh, facet where I say we live in Gnostic times because the Gnostics 2000 years ago ain't so crazy and wild conspiracy theories because of the simulation the theory. And, you know, just to add to what you said about Elon Musk, I was listening to one of his podcasts, or actually he was interviewed by Lex Friedman, and he says if there was one uh, question you could ask to, you know, some higher entity, what would you do, what would you ask? And he said, he thought about it for a moment, and he said, what is outside the simulation? Mm. So, like, you know, he completely, uh, then in this way, he's absolutely Gnostic, right? So, yeah, yes. And again, the, the, the big time genius, smartest scientist. You know, yeah. All, it's logical, it's mathematical, and it's very, very possible. So, so and it's what, very Gnostic. And yeah, so what the Gnostic in, Gnostics envision now, uh, engineers, you know, uh, in the Silicon Valley prove. So thank you so much, Miguel. It was a fantastic ride as usual. It is a little bit like a rodeo, you know, like a Gnostic rodeo. <laughs> I loved it. So before we disconnect, Miguel, how can our listeners connect with you? Well, they got to get out of the simulation. <laughs> the, no, I'm just kidding. I am not. I'm, I'm still working like you to get out of the simulation. See who, what's, what's on the other <laughs> side. Uh, no, but until then, the, I would say go to... Uh, thegodabovegod.com uh, it's that sort of uh, Paul Tillich who's orthodox created this idea of uh, tongue in cheek because obviously the Gnostics had the Demiurge and then they had a God the true consciousness <clears throat> so that he said the Gnostics believed in the God above God so that's what I call my website thegodabovegod.com it's got my podcast books social media videos uh, you know contact me there if you have any questions and mm. there we go that's my my, my simulation and and miguel is an extremely prolific uh, podcaster extremely pro and on top of this he writes books and you know even you know gets interviews and so on so and, and with this um, we end our podcast if you enjoyed the conversation sign in to the other goddess podcast you can find the longer version of this conversation on my youtube channel and consider buying my book the other goddess mary magdalene and the goddesses of errors and secret knowledge until next time